Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Chief of Police Ron Thomas uh, here to provide an initial update on uh, two officer involved shootings. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Clark here in a minute to, to provide those those overviews. But before I do that, I want to first acknowledge that uh, one person did lose their life and another person was seriously injured in these two incidents. And also these two incidents, I think, illustrate the challenge that we face here in Denver with uh, far too many guns in our community, individuals that uh, are inclined to, to use them. And I think it also uh, highlights the, the importance of our officers wearing their safety equipment while they're out uh, serving their uh, community. Uh, so uh, I understand that you all have had an opportunity to, to view the video and we'll certainly take uh, questions at the end. So Matt. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Commander Matt Clark with the Denver Police Department's Major Crimes Division. I appreciate you being here and giving us an opportunity to provide an update on the two officer-involved shooting incidents that occurred on Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. Um, just for order, I'll run through the first incident in its entirety, show some still photos, answer any questions, and then we can transition into the uh, other uh, incident as well, and Chief Thomas will be available. Uh, this is intended to be a follow-up briefing based upon information that we've gathered for after interviewing witnesses, uh, allowing the officers time to heal and recover so they could provide an interview to the investigators as well as analyzing evidence that was collected at the scene. There may be information I don't have at this point. There also may be information I cannot disclose based on the filing on a juvenile offender, uh, which may limit some of the information I'm able to offer. But to the degree we're able, we'll answer any questions at the end. On Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, at about 4.12 in the morning, a uniformed Denver police officer was conducting directed patrol at the Quality Inn, located at 2601 Zunai Street. The officer was seated in the driver's seat of his marked police vehicle, directly in front of the front entrance of the hotel. The officer had been at the location for several minutes when a male exited the front doors of the hotel and walked directly towards the officer's vehicle. Suddenly, without warning or prior interaction, the male produced a firearm from his jacket and began firing directly at the officer through the passenger side of the vehicle, striking the officer multiple times. The officer immediately exited his vehicle and moved to the back of the patrol car. The male went around the front of the officer's vehicle and continued firing upon the officer. While attempting to use his police vehicle as cover, the officer returned fire, striking the male multiple times. The injured officer called for additional assistance from other officers as well as ambulances to respond to the location. Responding officers took the male into custody. He was promptly assessed by a paramedic crew and transported to Denver Health Medical Center where he was later pronounced deceased. Additional officers attended to the injured officer and promptly loaded him into a police vehicle and transported him to the hospital for assistance. He has since been released from the hospital. Through the investigation, we've determined that the suspect drove to the location and parked on the west side of the building at 4.02 a.m. He remained near his vehicle for several minutes before walking around the building he went in front of the officer's vehicle and directly into the hotel. At that point, there was no interaction between the officer and the individual. While inside the hotel, the male inquired about renting a room from the clerk before uh, determining the cost was too high for him. He walked out of the hotel through the same main doors where the officer was previously parked and approached the officer's vehicle, discharging his firearm multiple times. After talking with numerous witnesses and people who knew the suspect, we have not been able to determine what led to him ambushing the officer. Investigators determined the suspect fired 18 rounds from a Glock 26 nine millimeter handgun. The suspect had an additional magazine, which was holding 16 rounds. The suspect was also found to be in possession of a loaded 38 caliber revolver, which was not fired during the incident. Firearm traces are being completed to determine whether the suspect was the owner of those firearms. The involved officer discharged 17 rounds from his duty handgun at the towards a suspect. The offender in this case has been identified as 35 year old Nicholas Lendrum, L-E-N-D-R-U-M. His date of birth is 12, three of 1987. I feel extremely fortunate that the, the injured Denver police officer was wearing a ballistic vest. The officer was struck by three of the rounds that were fired by the individual. All three impacted the officer's ballistic bulletproof vest. While the rounds stopped, uh, we're stopped by the officer's vest. He experienced significant bruising and pain at the impact sites from the rounds that were fired. He has since been released from the hospital and continues to recover. The injured officer who discharged his weapon is a corporal assigned to District 6. 
A corporal in the Denver Police Department is a field training officer who is responsible for training recruit officers and also serves as a line level supervisor. <clears throat> that officer has been with the department since 2013 and has not been involved in a previous police shooting incident. The officer's body worn camera was not activated during the event, but was activated by the officer after the shooting incident. The directed patrol action that the officer was taking at the hotel uh, when he was ambushed was not an action that required activation of the body worn camera under our policy. The officer did, however, have the presence of mind to activate the camera uh, as he, uh, after the shooting incident and as he was uh, waiting for additional officers to respond. The involved officer will complete the department's reintegration program before returning to his patrol assignment. Uh, the investigation of this incident and the next incident that I'll speak to is being investigated by the Colorado Bureau of Investigations, the Colorado State Patrol, the Denver Police Department's Homicide Unit, and the Denver District Attorney's Office. It's also overseen by the Office of the Independent Monitor, which is a civilian oversight entity. Uh, before we take questions, I'll briefly show some still shots. Again, the Chief uh, described that we've already released the video for those who choose uh, who haven't seen the video or choose not to watch it, we do want to give a perspective and uh, have some images from that were captured. <clears throat> there was surveillance video that we obtained from the hotel from the canopy uh, directly in front of the front doors. Uh, this particular image shows the officer seated in the driver's seat of his patrol vehicle. Uh, the offender had just exited the door. The door is still closing to the hotel. Uh, he has retrieved his firearm and that is a muzzle flash from the firearm that's directed directly at the officer. This is a photograph of the Glock 26 uh, 9 millimeter handgun that the offender used to shoot the officer with. This image is the revolver that he had, again, not fired during the incident. I'd like to provide a photograph of the officer's vest. Um, there's two specific defects noted in the vest that were impacted by bullets. It's this middle one in the vest here, and then the one in the upper right. Uh, this defect here is just a tear, and it was not associated with this incident. But the, this would have been the back panel of the officer's vest. Any questions about this incident before we move on? The suspect, is the, has there anything been turned up in his background and his history? Or, can lead you guys to believe that Again, we've, we've talked to uh, roommates, uh, people who, who knew him, uh, and nobody's been able to give us a, a reason, a cause for him ambushing the officer that day. Was he from Denver? Uh, he was not, he did not live in Denver. As far as you, as far as you determine, is, does he have any kind of criminal background? Um, I'm not clear on specifically his criminal background, and typically we don't speak to those during these sessions. Denver is from Colorado? He, he does have residence in Colorado. I'm not positive. I don't want to. So, the wounds were to the officer's back. He had two. He sustained two injuries to his back and one to his uh, front, uh, lower abdomen area. So was that probably the initial and then maybe rolling to get out of the vehicle? That's what we suspect. That the initial one impacted the officer on the front, and then he, as he rolled and, and moved to get out of the vehicle, that he exposed uh, his back, and that's what would have been struck by the uh, offender's gunfire. That's correct. And they were all fired while he was in the car? Uh, we believe so. Now, there are, there are rounds. There is gunfire that you'll see from the video as the officer is exiting the vehicle and trying to move to the back. Um, but the best of the officer recalls that those were impacts were while he was in, in the car and exiting the vehicle. When he called for backup, how many officers responded? I'm not sure. Did you know what the response time was? Immediate. That's a, an immediate call for help. Right. Were the under officers nearby? There were officers nearby the area. They, they were there very quickly. Did the officer say if the suspect said any words at all? Uh, when we spoke with the officer there, he described having no interaction, uh, no verbal exchange with the individual at any point. Why was there a directed patrol at the call of the unit? I think that's what you call it, a directed patrol? 
yeah, the officers were doing specific patrol there. It's it's somewhat of a routine patrol uh, for the safety uh, of the residents there, for the for the community. It's just that time, 4:10, uh, that time in the morning, um, is typically a lower call load, and the officers are providing specific patrol in, in different areas. Are they asked to go sit somewhere when, where there might be potential problems, or why is it direct? So I, I think it's fair to acknowledge that that particular location is being used as a temporary uh, emergency shelter for migrants, um, but it is also an active uh, hotel. And so um, in, in working with other city entities, we are providing uh, extra patrol at that location. And Chief, are there also directed patrols at other temporary shelters in the city? I've seen police cars at different shelters around town. So I Certainly. Is that kind of what's going on? Certainly. Activity in that area in addition? No. Okay. No, I think it's just a precaution that we're taking for the safety of the migrants as, as well as the safety of the community. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. The next incident occurred the same day, <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, 7 28 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday, June 7, 2023, uh, just before 7.30, Denver police officers received a shot spotter alert indicating seven gunshots had been fired in the area of Martin Luther King Boulevard and Dexter Street. Shortly after that call uh, or that notification, a call was received by the communication center from a caller who reported hearing shots fired in the area as well. Officers promptly responded to that call and located spent shell casings in the alley as directed by the shot spotter alert. While investigating for damage and injuries from the gunfire, the officers were flagged down by a citizen who advised he observed uh, the individual who was firing a gun. He specifically described that person as a black male wearing red pants who was in the company of a black female. That individual advised the officers that the two were last seen heading towards Martin Luther King Boulevard. Almost a minute after that uh, interaction, officers located a black male wearing red pants, riding an electric scooter with a black female near MLK and Elm. The two exactly matched the description that was provided uh, to the officers, and the two that were contacted were in the immediate vicinity of the shot spotter incident. The uniformed officers and marked police vehicles drove towards the individual with their emergency lights uh, flashing on their vehicle. The officers exited their vehicle and ordered the male off the scooter that he was riding. The male disregarded the officer's commands and began fleeing on the scooter. Officers followed in their vehicle and pulled on alongside the male near the baseball field on Elm Street, again directing him to stop. The male went behind the officer's vehicle and began going eastbound on Martin Luther King Boulevard away from the officers. He then cut between two multifamily uh, housing buildings and ran towards the east-west alley between Martin Luther King Boulevard and Throw Place. The officers parked their vehicle at the end of the alley near Forest Street and ran towards the suspect. Upon seeing the officers, the male turned around and began running from the officers. The pursuing officer, who previously had not drawn his firearm, recognized the male was holding a handgun in his right hand. The officer then drew his firearm and ordered the male to drop the weapon he was holding. The male began running southbound uh, between the houses with the officers chasing behind. And as he was running, <clears throat> the male turned towards the officer, took the uh, gun from a one-handed, right-handed grip to a two-handed pistol-style grip, and discharged the firearm at the uniformed officer, striking him once. The officer immediately returned fire, striking the suspect multiple times. Officers quickly took the suspect into custody, and he was transported by ambulance to the hospital for treatment. The officer was transported to the hospital by other officers who were on scene. The suspect has since uh, been released from the hospital and uh, is in the custody of the Gilliam Youth Center. Through the investigation, it was determined that the male suspect fired his handgun at least one time at the uniformed officer. The shot spotter system captured the exchange of gunfire between the officer and the subject, uh, noting 10 rounds were fired at that time. An unload of the officer's firearm indicated he discharged his weapon eight times. The firearm the suspect possessed was a Taurus 9mm semi-automatic handgun. That firearm had a drum style magazine which was capable of holding 50 5-0 rounds of 9mm ammunition. A shell casing that was recovered from this shooting scene was forensically matched to the shell casings recovered at the original shot spotter location near Dexter Street. Because the individual is a juvenile uh, and until he's filed on or direct filed into uh, district court, uh, I'm not able to identify him. 
The officer was struck one time by the round that was fired by the suspect. And after close uh, examination, it was determined that the round struck a magazine that was on the officer's uh, duty belt that he was wearing around his waist. It appears that either shrapnel from the magazine or a fragment from the bullet impacted the officer's lower left abdomen side. The officer sustained a significant bruise and pain from that impact. Again, we're fortunate the officer didn't uh, sustain further injury and he's been released from the hospital where he continues to recover. The injured officer who discharged his weapon is a patrol officer assigned to the patrol network investigations team in District 2. That team assists with narcotics investigations as well as conducting proactive patrols targeting violent crime hotspots. The officer has worked for the department since 2017 and was involved in one prior police shooting incident in 2019 where he was also shot at. The officer's body camera was activated during the event and captured the interaction with the suspect. And the involved officer will complete the department's reintegration program before returning to his patrol assignment. Uh, one last thing before I, I go into the videos, the, the department recognizes and wants to acknowledge the strong language that was used by the officers uh, during their interaction with the suspect. And that language, the nature of the commands that were given to the individual will be examined as part of the administrative review of this case. I'll take some, uh, I'll show you some still shots that we captured from the body worn camera. <clears throat> this is uh, between the two multifamily uh, buildings. There's a grass pathway. Martin Luther King Boulevard is the street to the back. The officer's coming in from the alley. Uh, this shows the uh, black male offender wearing red pants as described. Uh, he, is, he was previously moving away from the officer. He turns his body. He's got the firearm and the two-handed pistol grip and he discharges around at the officer. <clears throat> and again, another photo of the officer pointing the, or excuse me, of the offender pointing the uh, firearm directly at the officer. And you can see how close they are at that point. This is the firearm the uh, individual possessed. Again, a Taurus 9mm firearm with a 50 round drum magazine. There's a better photo of the magazine. Uh, and as I described, the magazine that the officer was carrying in his duty belt was impacted and just shows the, uh, the impact onto the metal magazine the officer was carrying. Any questions I can answer? Did the drum have, uh, was it loaded with 50 rounds? When we recovered it, it was not loaded. There was no, there was no more ammunition in the, in the drum. Uh, so shot spotter captured seven rounds. We recovered six shell casings. The shot spotter is audio only, you, you, or is there video for the shot spotter? It's only audio, correct. How old is the juvenile? 17 years old. Is there anything about his background you can share? No, sir. Since I'll ask you, you, know, you mentioned strong words in that video that you hear the officers say. What was your perspective when you watched the video and you heard what they were you know, certainly not consistent with our well-communicated uh, department values, and certainly that's something that we will address, but I think right now our focus is on his recovery and his healthy reintegration. Do you potentially face discipline for that? Certainly. Two, two violent incidents in one day in our criminals, are, are, are they becoming more emboldened? Are we hearing about it more? I mean, you've obviously been in law enforcement a long time. What are we seeing? Well, certainly in my 34-year career, we've not seen two officers uh, injured, two officers involved in shootings in just one uh, calendar day. Um, yes, as I've talked before, uh, there are far too many guns in our community, far too many individuals that feel emboldened uh, to use them in, in, during the daylight, um, in large crowds, uh, even very near where police officers are known to be. Uh, so certainly that's a, ch a challenge that we need to continue to address. Well, uh, you know, we've already, uh, you know, put in place a, a violence mitigation plan uh, specifically for the lower downtown area. There are also other areas around the city, uh, East Colfax, some other hotspots that we've identified, and we've actually uh, employed some, some very successful strategies there. Uh, certainly there's more work to do in, in other areas, and we will continue to review data, continue to come together to discuss current strategies and see if there are ways to, to alter those strategies in order to, to get in front of that violence. It's a strange question, but how common is it to find a gun with that kind of a drum on it? 
Well, more common today than it was once before, certainly. Um, not an everyday occurrence. I mean, certainly, you know, we've recovered uh, over a thousand illegal guns uh, just so far this year, um, and a handful of them had ha have had large capacity magazines. If there was any legislation that you would push for, perhaps <clears throat> Well, uh, you know, I, I think one thing that I would, would push for is for um, safe storage and, and, and responsible ownership, <coughs> excuse me, um, because we are far, finding far too many weapons that are, <coughs> excuse me, stolen out of vehicles, stolen out of homes because they're not properly secured. They're, you know, there are a number of tragedies that we've traced back to guns that were stolen or guns that were uh, irresponsibly maintained uh, to include some suicides. The girl or the woman that was at the juvenile, is she in custody? Can you give us any information on her? Uh, Matt, you want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, she, she is not in custody. Uh, we don't anticipate she'll face charges. Uh, we are still looking to interview her if uh, she'd like, if she'd cooperate. And then the vehicle that the first suspect drove to the back side of the hotel, is that a stolen vehicle? It was not a stolen vehicle. Yes, ma'am. One more clarification on that. I know we keep asking about location, but lives in Colorado, would you say lives in the metro area, has a residence in the metro area? For that he, he's, I, I believe it's it's in Weld County. I'm just not co confident on which city he lives in out there. Do you know why there were seven or six shots fired before Austin got there during the investigation? So there was, and we looked into that. We didn't find any defects indicating damage to property. We didn't find any houses that had been shot. We didn't find any injured victims as well. So that that investigation, the investigation of that weapon discharge will be, will be kind of bundled into this officer involved shooting since the casing is forensically matched. On the language question, some people might look at that video and, and there was a lot of adrenaline going. Can you explain? I, I think when you're in that situation and you use that kind of language, some people might find it like, well, if I was in that situation, I might use some of that language too. I mean, if it, if it was a bad situation, Certainly, you know, I think there's an understanding that this is a traumatic uh, incident and, and certainly a, a life-threatening incident. And so certainly uh, certain uh, actions, certain uh, language is, is, is understandable and, and even acceptable at times. What sort of penalty can an officer face if, if an investigation finds that that language was unacceptable? Well, I, you know, I think first we, w we need to really kind of analyze uh, all of the facts of the case um, and, and, and get a sense of, of the, the justification for the language, the, the intent for the language um, uh, before we start talking about penalties. But, you know, certainly, uh, again, <clears throat> the, the, the thing that we're most concerned about right now is the criminal investigation as well as the recovery of that officer. He was. And is it true that officers are not required to wear safety vests? It's optional? Uh, so it is strongly encouraged, and I think that the overwhelming majority of our officers do wear their safety equipment is something that we continue to push from the, you know, from the first day of the academy, you know, well throughout their careers. I do have a follow-up question on the Zunai shooting. Uh, you said the body camera was not activated. Yeah, so he was just sitting in his vehicle. And there had, you know, so just sitting in your vehicle on a directed patrol does not require you by policy to activate your body-worn camera. Certainly had there been an interaction, had, had there been somebody that would come up to the car to, to make a complaint, to, you know, to, to try to, you know, uh, you know file a, a criminal complaint or something like that, uh, there would have been uh, a need for him to activate uh, his camera to record that conversation, record that interaction, but he had no interaction with anyone. Uh, as he was there, and so no requirement to activate that uh, body-worn camera. But again, I think it's just uh, an, uh, you know, a credit to his uh, presence of mind to after a significant gun battle w in which he was struck three times that he still uh, activated his body-worn camera so that uh, everything from 30 seconds prior to that point and beyond uh, gets recorded. Would it be fair to say he was ambushed? I mean, that's kind of... Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there was nothing... 
uh, that, that indicated that this individual had any intent to do that. He went into the hotel, quickly came out, and immediately began shooting at the officer. Was there video inside the hotel that reported the interaction between that suspect and whoever he spoke with inside? Uh, we do have video from inside the hotel. I'm not sure what perspective it gives us. I don't recall specific to the interaction with the clerk. And there's no, I don't believe there's audio associated with that. And will there be a toxicology on the on there, being performed? Yes, that's part of the uh, autopsy and the, and the post-mortem exam conducted by the medical examiner's office. We expect a toxicology, typically eight to ten weeks. Is you and I street shooting where the weapon is registered to the suspect? So we are waiting on firearms, traces on both those firearms to determine ownership. Was it pretty well documented that this was a migrant shelter? Was it out there? Would the public have access to that and know about it? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question. Obviously, uh, the city administration um, has activated that location and others as uh, as uh, safety emergency shelters for uh, for the migrants that are coming into our city. Um, again, you know, other than you know just the just the being able to find safe shelter for folks, uh, there's not been a significant safety challenge. And Chief, do you know if there were any threats made to that quality in because of them serving the migrant population? No, no. Uh, again, we're waiting on firearms traces on that, uh, but I'm not clear at this point of how he came into possession of that firearm.